what I first like to say is that critique is something that is a real passion for me. I think it is one of the most effective ways to help kids understand what we're all aiming for. And it's something that I did personally in my classroom for many years, and then for the last five years, Scott has been trying to help me understand how we can, as an organization, with us, work with schools around the country to have teachers use this in, a, in more effective ways in their classrooms. And it was humbling for me to start in that, because what was intuitive for me wasn't clear to other people. And I've been struggling to figure out how to articulate that well. And I think Scott's wisdom as a fellow educator has really helped me understand that better. He often tells me when I'm being clear or not clear with explicating that in ways that are useful to everyone. And I'm still humble about it. But I remain excited about the potentials of it. So the first thing I'd like to say is that one of the best articles I've ever read about critique is in the current issue of Unboxed, put out by High Tech High, graduate school program that you're in. So if you have not yet read the article that's in Unbox number two by Lissa, the, the uh, NPR and radio person who explains in that article how critique has built the quality programming that they do, um, interviews by Stacey, what an amazing explication of critique. I just thought it was wonderful, and I would highly recommend that everybody read it. I was wished I had written it myself. <laughs> um, The first thing I wanted to say about critique is that I think we often think of critique as a way to improve the work of one individual child. And I think that is true often, that that's the best way to help kids do that kind of work. But we don't have the time with 25 kids to continually critique every piece of work that every kid does all the time. And we certainly don't have the time to critique in front of the group all the time. So you have to assume that the culture of the classroom that you build will be just as Lissa describes in her article in Unboxed, which is that you do so much public <coughs> critique for the elucidation of ideas for the class that eventually the culture of critique permeates the classroom. And informal critique starts taking place all the time. And that's the only logistical way you can get that critique done. So even as a teacher, you don't have time to meet with every kid at every stage of his or her math work, or writing work, or reading work, or at any point. You have to build a culture, as she suggests in that article, where the kids are informally critiquing each other constantly and asking for each other's critique constantly, just to keep up with the flow of things. You have to build a place where critique is welcomed and needed all the time, where kids are always saying, look at this. Look at this with me. Can I show you this? like many of us do in our professional lives when we create anything. That has to be there. The formal critiques that you do in your classroom are not for the edification of one child. So if Rob produces a piece of writing, I'm not going to take 20 minutes of the class's time to talk about it unless Rob happens to have produced a piece that's so generative that it embodies the very issues that I need for a class lesson right at that moment. In which case, I'll ask Rob, can I use your piece for critique? And if it's a piece he's proud of, we'll use that piece, but we'll use it as the lesson for the day. So the critiques that I'm suggesting here are class lessons for the edification of the entire class on whatever issue, in whatever topic, you need to work on. And I would say that's for writing, it's for math, it's for anything. And I pretty much I think there's, there's not an issue that you don't need to address with your students that you can't address better through critique than through you standing up there and telling kids what to do. So if you are trying to teach kids how to solve a quadratic equation using something other than the quadratic formula, because the quadratic formula is just memorized by kids and they don't really understand what they're doing, you could go up and talk to them about it for 25 minutes, or you could have three or four kids put their alternative versions of how they might solve the quadratic equation on the board and critique each one as a lesson. It doesn't matter what you're studying. If you have a model of it that you can critique, you can use that critique as a formal lesson to name the things that you want your kids to understand. So tonight's work is going to be looking at qualities of what makes good writing. But the purpose of it is not to make this piece of writing better. 
the purpose of it is as a class, what can we learn about what makes good writing that we can then all use? And so it's really important that you, as a teacher, select the right work. And um, welcome. Thank you. Now, oh, we did introductions, and we missed them. So That's please. okay. No. <laughs> I'm Diane Daymeyer. And Roe? I'm a um, grandmother. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we were just talking about critique, and we're going to be looking at some writing today as examples of thinking about what makes good writing. And I think you can tell kids what makes good writing again and again and again, and they don't hear anything unless they actually see it. I think kids need to see good writing in order to do it then they need to name exactly what it is in the writing that they can take away. And if they haven't named it concretely with you, they won't take it away. They'll leave with an impression. And these are mistakes that I'm sharing that I made. I assume that if Stacy wrote a beautiful piece of writing, we read it aloud as a group and then admired it, that the other kids would be inspired and take that and that their writing would be better. And I learned that I was wrong. That if I haven't taken the second step of naming the five or 10 things that she does as strategies, then the assumption of the kids is Stacy is a good writer, but I'm not. And that was great, but <clears throat> magically she somehow does things that I don't do. And if we can't name them as specific strategies that she includes or uses, and then the kids can write down, oh, I could have used that strategy, I could have done this, then they don't really know how to make their own writing better. So the process of critique is really a process of naming. Uh, I'm going to start without writing. I'm going to start with some uh, visual images for you. So I did a critique session at a school that's part of the Expeditionary Learning School Network that's got my work with. That was an elementary school, is an elementary school, Robius Elementary School in Midlothian, Virginia, just south of Richmond. <coughs> I had the staff for two hours, and we did this kind of work together, critique and work together. And then the rest of the day, I was walking into classrooms and running critiques with students. That afternoon, I walked into the kindergarten, and a little boy came up to me, and he said, I know who you are. You're the critique man. <laughs> and I said, yes, I am. And he said, you taught a class to my teacher this morning. I said, yeah, I did. And he said, and now we already do critique in our class. And I said, you do? He said, yeah, you want to see? I said, sure. So he gave, put out his hand, and I took his hand, and he led me across the class. And he brought me to a corner, and he said, this is our critique center. And he pointed to the sign that said, critique center. And I said, you have this just since this morning? Just since that? He said, mm-hmm. He said, that's amazing. And he said, don't tell anyone, but yesterday it was here, but it was called the writing center. <laughs> Change the name. <laughs> and I said, does it work any different? And he said, yeah, because now we do critique instead of just writing. And I said, well, what is critique? And he says, you know, I thought you invented it. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't invent it. This is a strategy that we all try to use. I said, how do you do it? He said, well, yesterday we had to come to the center and we had to draw something and then write at least one sentence about it. But today it's different. Now we draw something and we write one sentence or more. And then we have to show it to three friends. And they each give us some advice about what we could change, but we don't have to listen to them. <laughs> but if we want to, we can take their advice. And then we have to do another draft, and we have to use their advice if we want to. And I said, was it useful? He said, oh yeah, we made lots of changes. And I said, could you show me your work? And he said, yeah, here's my first draft, here's my second draft. And he said, we had to be kind, couldn't be mean, we had to be specific, and we had to be hopeful. Those were our rules. I said, that's great. And what struck me when I looked at the kids' work was that in all of my efforts to help high school students and middle school students and teachers critique, my biggest struggle has been being specific. People use general words to describe what they like, but it's not specific enough to be helpful. And what struck me about kindergartners are they're so concrete that they were totally specific. So when he showed me a second draft, I thought, I know exactly the three pieces of advice that his friends gave him, because they were so specific that you could see the changes. Okay? So 